never heard that before. That was new. Yeah. We're going to get started fairly soon. Just going to let a couple more people come in. <coughs> I feel like we should commission someone for like intro music. So. <laughs> yeah, I thought about actually doing that. Making it all fancy. Probably copyright thing. Probably. What, 30 seconds you can play of something? Okay. Devin, I'm having trouble. Uh, Judith has asked if you are all muted, and yes, you are. Um, so only the presenters are able to speak. So I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Emily Schlemutz. I'm the curator at the Wisconsin Museum of Cults and Fiber Arts, and I'm very glad to be joined today by Devin McElrath, who's our Collection and Ex Education Manager. Um, we're really happy to be able to present this exhibition to you, Wisconsin Quilts, Stories in the Stitches. But before we get started, um, we will do our best to answer any chat questions you might have. Just enter them in the chat down below. Um, if you're following along on Facebook, we'll also be trying to check Facebook and answer questions there. Um, and we'll do it in live, live time, so um, in real time. So if you have questions, just feel free. Um, so without further ado, um, I thought I would introduce the museum a bit and um, for those who don't know us um, and then go and talk about the quilts. Um, one note, um, we've decided because there are 30 quilts in this exhibition, um, we decided to break the um, break the tour up a little bit, um, we're going to be hosting another tour on August 13th with uh, some of our museum partners. So today you'll see quite a few of the, um, the quilts from private collections, and then we're going to do another tour with that focuses more on the museum works. Um, again, that'll be most likely August 13th, but a, a mailer and a Facebook invite will go out um, on our website. So. I'm going to hopefully advance. So the museum was formed um, out of a desire to record the histories and stories around quilts and their makers and branched out into other fields of fiber arts often associated with women's work. Um, but the museum's roots really extend back to 1988 when a group of women quilters in southeastern Wisconsin um, founded the Wisconsin Quilt History Project, um, whose mission was to study the history and creativity expressed in quilts through documentation and research. Um, since 1988, over 8,000 quilts and their stories have been captured. Um, these records um, provided the material for an award-winning book called The Wisconsin Quilt Stories and the Stitches, and also created a starting point for developing a physical museum. Along with the book in 2001, the woman purchased the Hoffman Baker Farmstead to turn into a museum. It's set on a 2.2 acre farm um, and the museum's campus includes seven original stone buildings, stone and timber structures, the dairy barn and also the farmhouse, silo, ice house and summer kitchen, smokehouse and blacksmithery. This year, um, we're celebrating the museum's 10th anniversary with this sweeping exhibition based on the quilts and stories documented in that formative publication, Stories in the Stitches. It brings together 30 quilts from the book um, 
and they really tell detailed personal histories and incredible stories. So we're going to tell some of those stories today. Um, one thing to note, I think it's really interesting, there's a lot of quilts from around the Civil War in this exhibition, um, which is pretty remarkable, and many of these quilts are still within the descendants' um, hands. So it's, it's a pretty great um, exhibition. Here's, a, here's some install shots of the exhibition. Um, and let's start with the, we're gonna kind of go around the room. So it's just gonna, um, it's, we're just gonna kind of tour as we would be touring in the, in the museum. So the World's Fair of 1933 was an advantageous opportunity for Pearl, um, an Appleton knitter and mill, or knitting mill worker to show her skill. Uh, Sears was hosting a quilt competition and Pearl, with the help of her daughter, Louise, constructed this uh, totally original design for the fair. As you notice, the D in world was switched backwards, and this could have been an error or may have been done deliberately, in keeping with the superstition that quilters would avoid making perfect quilts. Um, Pearl's quilt won a ribbon at the, first, um, at the first level of competition, certainly earning her bragging rights, and this quilt is privately owned. Next page. So this is the uh, Deer and Butterflies quilt. It is a WA, WPA uh, handcraft project. Um, it's from 1935 to 1940-ish. Um, so the, work, the Works Progress Administration was one of many parts of the New Deal passed in 1933 by President Franklin Roosevelt. Um, Milwaukee State Teachers College, MSTC, took the WPA's message to heart and created a nationally recognized handicraft project with the aim of teaching and developing crafting skills and crafts that would be sold to stimulate the economy. To avoid competition with private businesses, the, works, uh, the work was sold to government institutions. Handcrafted dolls, quilts, and toys would be made and then sold to government orphanages, schools, and nurseries. Quilt portfolios were designed by artists in the WPA rather than quilters. Um, this presented a unique challenge to the seamstresses who wanted to construct the projects but the results are wonderful and unique styles meant to provide cheerfulness to children in need. This quilt is called Remember the Maine. Um, it originated in Kenosha, Wisconsin and currently resides at the Kenosha Historical Society. The quilt was made actually in 1898 to commemorate the sinking of the ship, the Maine, off the coast of Cuba that same year. Um, the ship lay anchor in Havana's harbor to protect Americans from riots during protests for Cuban independence um, from Spanish rule. Many Americans blamed Spain for the loss of the 260 American lives on board the Maine and protests of free Cuba per percolated throughout the United States, including in Kenosha. By April, the US had declared war on Spain and the battle cry became, remember the Maine. Um, this quilt was made by a mother-daughter duo who were members of the Kenosha Women's Club. And you can see they use many, you know, patriotic colors in this quilt, um, red, white, and blue. Um, and although this was, you know, prior to the woman's right to vote, they were obviously very politically um, engaged. This is the applique floral medallion quilt. Uh, it's from the late 1800s to early 1900s. Um, and it was made by Alice Hay. I should, I'm just gonna avoid last names because I'm really bad at them. So Alice and her daughter, Mary, uh, is predominantly cotton. It features both colors popular at the time and classic German applique shapes. This quilt is a beautiful fusion of fashionable and traditional. Mary and her mother, <laughs> Alice and her mother, Mary, um, I flipped that, made the quilt together in the late 1800s. After completion, it was presented to Mary's grandson, Fred, and his new wife, Martha. A large reason this quilt remains in such good condition is that it, is, um, it has remained stowed away only to be taken out on very special family occasions. Um, this incredible Civil War eagle and flowers um, was found in Dodge County, Wisconsin. It was made by Mary Bell Chauvin, who was known as Polly to her friends. Um, her husband, John Chauvin, uh, enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War, and Mary made this quilt um, in anticipation of his return. 
Unfortunately, John um, passed away from wounds um, that he received during the war, and so she never was able to give it to him. Um, she had six kids. John and Holly had six kids, and she raised them um, after his passing. Um, and she never used this quilt. It was really used as a show quilt. Um, so she won many blue ribbons for it. And you can see it's a very original design. Um, it uses this applique pattern um, with the, you know, the central eagle. Um, there's also trapunto um, within the grapes. So um, trapunto is a form of stuffing, that stuffing from the back to get sort of a raised applique feature. Um, and it's just a truly incredible quilt. It was also um, the cover of that book, uh, Wisconsin Quilt Stories and the Stitches. So we're really lucky to have it. Um, you can see in the picture, this is when we received it on the right. So you can kind of see that applique detail. Um, and when we get into the gallery, hopefully we can show a little bit more of that as well. This quilt is called the Circuit Rider. Um, Circuit Rider was the name given to ministers who would travel in order to serve multiple small and often sparse congregations in a certain area. And uh, the individual who made it, Catherine, had married um, such a man. He wrote in his diary that it must have been God's will that he marry a woman as skilled in all manner of homemaking as her, as she often had to tend their land while he was away. Catherine made this quilt to pass time while alone as her family mostly resided in Germany. Note how this quilt has borders on only two sides. Um, it is meant to be placed against, um, on a single bed against the wall. So it's the left and the bottom. There's a, a little kind of line that goes across the top of it too. And on the very back of this quilt, which you can't see here, but we might be able to show you what I'm walking around if I remember, um, it has a beard guard on the back to keep um, oil from a gentleman's beard from ruining your quilt. It's just a piece of fabric that's all in the back. Um, this quilt was actually made in Kansas. Uh, Mary Shove hand pieced the Prairie Star blocks when she was 20 years old. Um, she chose the red and green color scheme, which was so popular at the time um, during the 1960s, 1860s, excuse me, and set the blocks alternatively with a pattern that came to be known as autumn leaf. The bed covering was made um, for her as a wedding gift, um, as a wedding quilt. And you can see there, uh, when we get closer, there's many, many tiny stitches, which really showed um, the, her skill. Um, a distant relative of Mary's brought this quilt to Wisconsin after the Civil War, which is how it ended up in the book. Red work was a popular embroidery trend for seamstresses in the late 1800s. Uh, small squares of muslin would be stamped with a design that could then be traced with red embroidery thread, and these were often sold for a penny each at a corner store, giving them the name penny squares. Um, Margaret Radcliffe made this quilt for her daughter. However, she was not just a mother or quilter, but also an advocate of education and tireless organizer of groups and campaigns. She was even a delegate to the International Congress of Women in 1920. Margaret grew up on Walker's Point and married James Edward Radcliffe, who was the owner of Radcliffe Manufacturing Company, uh, where Margaret also did the bookkeeping. Eventually, they moved to West Dallas, where the quilt was uh, donated. One of my favorite things in this one is on the very bottom left corner, which I will probably show you when we're up there because it is my favorite. She lovingly embroidered steaming potatoes, and I have never seen potatoes embroidered, and it just makes me very happy. Um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite stories. Um, it, these are two quilts from around 1865. They were uh, made by sisters, Lucy Sales and Anne Roxy Sales. Um, and over the next hundred years, these quilts were separated um, and the families lost touch. Um, their shared origins were lost until 1983 when they both were in a exhibition at the State Historical Society. You can see on the bottom right corner, we've included um, that catalog that include that had those two works um, from in 1983. So it's it's pretty incredible. They are now reunited again in this space. And although the families don't know each other, it's nice to be able to see them next to each other um, in the exhibition.
This is a pineapple quilt. Um, and after 1864, the maker Elizabeth um, made it out of cotton. It is very similar to another quilt that is um, located elsewhere in the exhibit called Aunt Kitty's Fantasy, which we will, we've talked about it in a previous um, online conversation, but we'll hopefully cover in our next one. Um, but I lost my place. So after Elizabeth um, lost her husband in the Civil War, she opened a, a millinery, so a hat making, hat and bonnets, uh, to support herself and her two sons. And while the pineapple pattern seen here reflects the fabrics popular in the 1960s hats, it also reminded Elizabeth of the windmill blades from the farms that surrounded her home in Illinois. So she used scraps from her, her shop to make this quilt. Um, this quilt has a fairly sad story. Um, at 17, Esther Garthwaite, the maker of the quilt, was married unmarried and pregnant, um, and her family forbid her to marry the gentleman, um, the father of her child. Um, the rejected young man went headed out west, and Esther stayed with her family in a small cabin in south central Wisconsin. Um, while she awaited her baby, she made this quilt. Unfortunately, Esther, um, after soon after giving birth, came down with a fever and died uh, after died from childbirth. Um, the baby named Charles uh, received this quilt and it was within, it was with the family until it was donated to the um, Milton Historical Society. <laughs> right, this is a postage stamp uh, coverlet. It is not a completed quilt. The backing still has all of the paper piecing in it, um, so you can see scripts from the uh, 1940s or earlier. Um, so to construct this quilt, Charlotte Waller pieced 6,372 one-inch square fabric swatches together, carefully basting each piece onto paper before assembling the whole top. It contains a variety of calico prints and the fabric um, was basted onto scrap paper that was made of old letters, which you can see parts of that cursive on the back. Uh, the process is called English paper piecing, um, and it has some very standard colors of the time in the Prussian blues and the fugitive lavenders. Um, so um, Prussian blue was a dark blue pigment. Um, it's often considered the first modern synthetic dye, probably synthesized by German printers um, or painters in the early 1700s. And, um, it was often used in uniforms of the Prussian army and that is where it got its name. But Charlotte lived her whole life in Sussex, England. Her son George is responsible for the quilt's location in Wisconsin as he and his wife moved to America after he served in the Crimean War. In one visit to Sussex, uh, Charlotte gifted the quilt to George and his new family, forming a link between English and American homeland. And this quilt is not photographed very well, but it is a phenomenally heavily embroidered red work quilt also. Um, so this is the uh, Nasita Methodist Women's Society quilt um, it's from 1886, and it was an embroidered fundraiser. Um, it's a unique and thoughtful project. This quilt was made as a fundraising effort to facilitate a major update of the Nasita United Methodist Church. For 10 cents each, one could have their name embroidered on the quilt. In total, 502 different signatures were collected, including some from local businesses. The quilt was then auctioned off to raise additional funds. Miss John Kingston won the quilt, and after many years, the quilt was returned to Nasita, where it now hangs as a lasting testament to the community who made it. Um, this quilt is known as the First Lady's Crazy, and that's in part be due to the fabric in the quilt. Um, this quilt has really unique you know, political connections. It was made by Violet McMillan, Violet McMillan um, and she was married to a physician uh, who worked for the government, 
Uh, they both lived in Washington, D.C. Um, among, among the political and powerful elite. Uh, one of Violet's close friends was a seamstress for the White House and saved the remnants from her sewing, giving them to Violet. Um, she gave her brocades and velvets from the dress of Mary A. McElroy, the pres President Chester A. Arthur's sister, who served as first lady for her widowed brother. Silks from Rose Cleveland, Grover Cleveland's sister, who also assumed the responsibilities of first lady um, during his first year in office. Additional fabrics came from Cleveland's wife, Frances, after their marriage in 1886, and from his eldest daughter, Ruth. Um, Violet began this crazy quilt in 1890 with the historic remnants and embroidered around each, one, each patch. From 1901 to 1901 she, to 1909, she received additional pieces for the quilt from Theodore Roosevelt's wife, Edith, uh, and incorporated them into her design. This quilt still resides with the descendants of Violet in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And you can see there's some really incredible embroidery within this quilt. Um, I particularly like the spider web down on the bottom right. Um, and it is signed. We can try to find her signature when we go up to the gallery. Um, but you can see there's quite a bit of embroidery and wonderful work within that. This um, glorious, it's, this is the oldest quilt in the exhibition. It was made around 1825. Um, it was it has a, also has kind of a political story. Um, Catherine Penniman Bradford made this Yankee puzzle quilt in, in 1825 for her daughter, Catherine Ann, as a marriage gift. Um, since its creation, the quilt has passed through nine subsequent Catherines, each named Catherine Bradford in honor of their ancestor. The quilts maker's story began, begins in 1778 when she was born in Massachusetts, the daughter of a well-known shipbuilder whose shipyard built the Continental Frigate, the Confederacy, which was the first warship owned by the US government. She was 15 when she married 26-year-old Charles Bradford, who was a sea captain um, and who sailed frequently between America and England. Um, and he was the great, great, great grandson of William Bradford, who came to America on the Mayflower and became the first governor of Plymouth County Colony. When Catherine was 24, she gave birth to her daughter, Catherine Ann. And when Catherine Ann married, as I mentioned, she received this incredible silk quilt from her mother. Silk was um, very expensive at that time and had to be imported to the colonies. Um, the center of the quilt was brought from England by her husband. And the stitching suggests um, at the center that it's, um, it may have been pre-embroidered because it's not consistent with some of the other embroidery within the quilt. Um, Catherine surrounded the medallion with these small hand piece triangles of silk and added fanciful embroidery at the bottom, as you can see around the edges. In more recent times, this set of triangles around the center has been called Yankee Puzzle or Hourglass, but those names were recorded between 1894 and 1929. Um, again, this is an heirloom quilt. It was, it's been also been exhibited multiple times and received multiple awards um, for its beauty. Um, and there's, you obviously fit a bed at some point. So it's been well, well loved. This, uh, another silk quilt, which is also um, extremely old um, from about 1830. Um, but actually the materials date back to at least uh, 1752. Um, when Joseph Bruckminster's daughter, Francis, turned 18, he wanted to honor his daughter with a special gift of fashion. Joseph carefully chose a unique dress, um, the freedom gown, as the family called it, boasted an attached skirt that was open enough in the front to reveal a pink silk quilted petticoat. Francis married Jonathan Brewer in 1763 and gave birth to daughter Susanna in 1764. Um, According to family records, Susanna likely made this quilt for, um, from pieces of her mother's gown. Susanna sewed three quilts for her daughters, um, for her children, and it was not until the 1830s that the remaining third of the quilt became this quilted petticoat at the center. Um, 
and it's a simple medallion quilt material from another another dress a cousin's dress um, was used to complete the corners and borders um, Susanna started a family tradition of passing on the quilt to the eldest daughter in each generation and it still does um, reside with the eldest daughter and she actually lives here in Cedarburg um, And then I just wanted to um, leave with a quote. Uh, this is actually from um, Ellen Court, who wrote the Stories in the Stitches book. Um, you know, as one descendant um, in the exhibition describes, she really sees herself um, not only as the caretaker of this quilt, but also as part of an inheritance pattern that empowers her as a woman and connects her to the generations of women before her. Um, so there's really this, you know, this passage of history throughout all these quilts, not only in their making, but also in, in the descendants and, um, and the passing down of the quilts through, through, through families. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you to all of the families who contributed to this exhibition and to the museums who also trusted their beautiful quilts with their, our, in our care. Um, it's been an incredible exhibition to put together. Um, and to locate all of them. Um, so thank you very much. So now we're going to move, if Devin is in the gallery, we're going to move upstairs into the gallery and do kind of a walkthrough so you can see how the exhibition is put together. Okay, so um, for those who haven't been in our space, we uh, have a retrofitted barn. Um, as I mentioned, this was a German farmstead um, that the museum um, converted into an, a muse into an exhibition space. Um, when you walk into the gallery, oh yes, and we have these wonderful cathedral ceilings. It's just beautiful. Um, so when you walk into the gallery, this is what you see, um, the Civil War quilt sort of at, on that title wall, um, which was also, you know, the, the center, the, the cover image on that book. Um, you have the floral applique and the circle right, circuit writer quilt, as well as the WPA works. Um, Can everyone see that? Is that other people having trouble? Okay, hold on one sec. Let me see if I can. Can you pin the audio? Or the I pinned the video, yeah, I did. Yeah. that work for people? Mm, can the other one. Every, people are saying got it. Okay. Yes, we're good. So maybe start back if you can, Devin. So again, this is our incredible exhibition space. Um, it really shows quilts well. It's kind of a fibrous material wood, and I think that complements the, the fibers of the quilts and the textiles that we show. Um, we open the exhibition with the Civil War Eagle and Flowers, and Devin might be able to get close to that quilt so you can see some of that incredible applique. Um, 
I'm going to let her step up for a minute. <clears throat> You can see there's this raised work. The, the eyes of the birds are these is, are, are really incredible. There's like this embroidery within the bird's eyes. Um, and then those stuffed grapes. And the eagle was really a symbol of, you know, um, Polly or Molly Belshavin's, um patriotism and, you know, her belief in the union cause and thinking about her husband um, at war. He actually enlisted after they had those six children. So to think about that is pretty incredible. It also has this really beautiful scalloped edge. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, I have a very bad cold. You can see just the scalloping also within the quilting. And to think that she, you know, she did this all by hand. This is. So as we turn to the left, we get the appliqued floral medallion. Again, those iconic colors. And this was only brought out, this is only brought out for special occasions, which is why it's in such incredible condition. And then as you turn to the right, we have the circuit rider quilt. And as Devin mentioned, circuit rider was um, meant to go against a wall. Um, so it's got the border only on two sides. And more applique. And then in the back, there's that whisker guard or beer guard um, which was meant to protect the quilt from oily beards. Oh. Devin, you just went blank. Give her a minute. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. Well, while we're waiting for that to come back online, I can tell you a little bit about the research that went into this exhibition. Um, many of these, you know, the book was written 20 years ago, so um, finding the descendants was um, a little bit tricky, um, but we were able to, as I said, find 30 of these quilts. Um, and mostly that was done actually through social media, looking up descendants on social media on Facebook um, and trying to contact them. Um, there was one, the Civil War Eagle and Flowers, we contacted through a um, auction house. But um, because a lot of these are still in the family, it was, it was really reaching out to descendants. Um, I think she's back. So I'm going to spotlight the video again. Hopefully that'll work. Okay, and then as you come around the corner um, from the floral applique, 
You see the prairie star and autumn leaf quilts as well as that embroidered penny square and I know Devin has several favorite penny squares that she'll point out to you. Um, we're a little blurry here. That's good. We were joking that these penny squares would make excellent playing cards. Um, so maybe we will tell the West Dallas Historical Society that they should turn these into playing cards. There are the hot steaming potatoes. But you can see there are just some incredible little vignettes within here. Next to those two are those two, the Lucy and Anne Sales quilts. Um, the sisters reunited once again. And the stitching in these quilts are just really wonderful. Maybe Devin can get up close and so you can see them. And these are made um, around the Civil War. And this one, the stitching is just incredibly fine. As you turn this way, we have the postage stamp quilt, which came from the Burlington Historical Society. Again, this is just a quilt top, um, but it's the colors that have retained their pigment incredibly well. Um, and you can see there's that paper piecing. The reason why it's called a postage stamp quilt is because it's made up of these one by one squares, the size of a postage stamp. This is the Star of Lemoyne. This one currently resides at the Milton Historical Society. Um, Esther, the maker of this quilt, was, resided in Milton. This is the pineapple quilt made by the milliner. And then as we come around the corner, we have the World's Fair. With the backwards D.
And then those WPA works. Remember the main. Another backwards S. This one belongs to the Kenosha Historical Society, given its connection to Kenosha. And then as we turn the corner, there's some quilts that we will be talking about next time. Um, that's the Nasida Methodist Church quilt, the one that was made as a fundraiser. See the beautiful stitching and embroidery. We actually have a similar quilt hanging in our entryway. Um, it's called our Mariner's Compass quilt and it has um, the names of um, people who just donated to the museum to help um, start the museum. So we decided to bring that one out during this time. It's a beautiful quilt. Um, so if you do come to the museum, you'll get to see that. It is a completely original design. This quilt is one um, from the Oshkosh Museum of Art, and we'll be talking a bit about that next time. And then this is the First Lady's Crazy, which was made of scraps from First Lady's, remnants from First Lady's dresses. You can see the wonderful spider. I'm not quite sure what that is, the Cupid with the bottle. <laughs> That one's Aunt Kitty's Fantasy. That one is in our collection. And again, we'll talk about that one next time. Um, but it's also um, made from remnants. Um, it was made by a woman who worked as a milliner for Queen Victoria. And then those are the remnants from those hats, from her hats. So it's velvet. It's really incredible quilt. That one's a Mariner's Compass and that's also in our collection. And that was stitched in honor of her, with her mother in honor of her marriage. Um, those two are from the West Dallas Historical Society. The one in the case is really interesting. Again, we'll probably talk about that next time, but um, just to give you an idea, that one was made by a 13 year old girl um, for what, when she was studying the United States map. And that one resides at the West Dallas Historical Society because they actually occupy the former school building That one's from the Wauwatosa Historical Society. It was made by, in honor of Sarah Clapp Goodrich, who was a Wauwatosa resident 
um, who moved to China and started a school. And when she came back, her friends um, gave her this quilt as a memento. This is the center medallion Yankee puzzle, which is the silk quilt and the oldest quilt in this exhibition. It's from about 1825 and you can see the center medallion, which is embroidered with her name, Catherine Bradford. <coughs> it also has this lovely embroidery on the um, edging. That quilt is called a wig, wig rose, and it was made, they think, by the in honor of the wig party. Um, that that style of quilt, and that one is also in our collection. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But the stitching on that is really quite lovely. Those two are also in our collection. That's by um, a woman who helped Mary McAlwain um, in her shop for many years. Um, she. Uh, Mary McAllen was a, owned a famous quilt shop in Wisconsin and made patterns and sold patterns. And when she, this woman got married, um, she, Mary said to her, choose, choose two patterns. And so her husband chose one, the red poppy, and um, she chose the other, the Muscoville grapes. And it was actually made over the course of many, many years. Several people had hands in sewing it, but um, they're pretty, Incredible. Those are from a little bit later, about mid 19th century. And that one is the Freedom Gown Medallion. Again, you can see it's it's almost chi it's child size, and she would have given this to her daughter. Um, you have that center medallion, which is made out of that petticoat um, from the dress, and then the Exterior is that those are scraps from other dresses, from another dress. That is the exhibition. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, you can put them in the chat. Um, I do hope that you'll come and see it. It's open at the museum through August 29th, and we are currently open to the public um, Wednesday through Sunday, um, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, and Sunday noon to 4. Um, we do hope you come and visit. Um, we are, we do have a little bit of a capacity limit, but it doesn't seem to, it's, it's 10 people per person. Oh yes, yeah, so, so there's a question about the reversed letters. So that's an interesting question. Um, hold on, let me just, there's some, um, there's some school of thought that quilters were superstitious and thought that they should avoid having like these perfect quilts. And so they would make some sort of error. So some sort of obvious error, like the reversing of the, of the lettering. Um, maybe that's what uh, the maker was thinking, um, but we, you know, we'll never really know. Um,
Okay, well, I just want to say again, thank you all so much for coming and thank you, especially to the families who donated to the who loaned their quilts to this exhibition. It really means a tremendous amount to the museum and um, and it's really nice to be able to share them. So I, I it's very, I really appreciate it. And I know um, Melissa and Devin do as well. Um, as a reminder, this these ex, these programs are free, but we do appreciate donations. Um, so if you're, I think there's a link up above, I'll post it again, um, but to, we really appreciate any donations to help continue this programming. Um, again, thank you so much. I'll stick around for a little bit in case anyone else has any other questions and we can just admire this beautiful Civil War eagle and flowers. I was going to say, we did have one question in the Q&A and it is about purchasing the book. Um, uh, so the book is available on Amazon in PDF form or you can um, look at like half price books or um, like thrift books. I found one the other day on thrift books for like six dollars. So. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, the publisher went out of business. It was actually reprinted in 2009. So sometimes you'll find a second edition, um, but the publisher went out of business and we've been trying to get, um, recover some of those materials so that maybe we could do a reprinting again. Um, but uh, in lieu of that, it is available on Amazon. And if you come to our rummage sale, which is uh, in two weeks, typically I do see a couple there as well. So, um, You'll never know, <laughs> but they are available. This will be available, the presentation will be available to view again. Um, right after we close out, I will upload it to YouTube. So um, you can access it on our YouTube channel and I will post a link to that right now. Seems like Devin, you're on it. Let me do that. I was looking for the Amazon link. <laughs> it also is archived on Facebook, so um, if you can't find it on YouTube. Okay, I think with that we're gonna we're gonna close out if anyone has any other questions. Otherwise I'm gonna say have a great weekend.